Coming to you now is Lahem Panim with your host, Pastor Cameron Urey, Senior Pastor and Bible Teacher at Renton Park Chapel in Renton, Washington. Hello and welcome to Lahem Panim. Thank you for joining us today as we begin a new series on a book of the Bible that has so much to say to us as we face these very difficult and unusual times. If you're seeking a book that shows what God can do in and through men and women who are sold out to him, this book is it. Because it gives us an account of the dynamic birth and the explosive growth of the early church. And of course, I'm talking about the book of Acts, a book that in the midst of what we're facing right now, is really going to help us to grasp what it means to be the church during all these trials that we're facing in these strange and unusual days. Now, the way I want us to start off today is by having you think of the many giants of the faith in and throughout all of Scripture, the men and women that you admire the most. And I want you to think, which is the one, besides Jesus, of course, that if you were given the opportunity, you would want to follow around. If you had the opportunity to minister with and be discipled by anybody to share in their life experiences, who would that be? Would you join Noah in his ministry of building the ark and preaching repentance to the people? Would you sit under Daniel in Babylon and then Persia joining him in prayer in that room with its windows open facing Jerusalem? Would you even be willing to join him in a den of lions? Maybe you'd follow David through his many excursions, joining him on the battlefield to face Goliath, or running with him in fear from King Saul who would be seeking to take both of your lives. You know, What is amazing when we think of these giants of the faith is that nobody that we would want to seek to follow, to sit under, to emulate, had a perfect or stress-free life. Many, if not all of them, faced persecutions and dangers like we can't even imagine. There are a number of men and women in Scripture that I look up to and would love to follow but whom I also think would be very challenging to follow in ministry. And one of these in particular, although I would love to follow him, it would be incredibly difficult because of what this man faced. He was the victim of numerous hate crimes, being pelted with stones, being whipped mercilessly, dealing with imprisonment and even shipwreck. And of course, I'm talking about the Apostle Paul. I can think of few people that I admire more than him, yet at the same time, I think about how difficult it would be to share in his ministry. And we know enough of what Paul and his fellow travelers had to endure to know that anyone identifying with Paul and the cause of Christ, they were candidates for the same kind of sufferings that Paul faced. But suffering, especially for the sake of Christ, it's not something that we should seek to avoid. And that's because suffering and difficulty is what causes us to grow. And that's why James writes in James 1, 2 through 4, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And so, while looking at the life of Paul, our flesh might hesitate to want to share in his sufferings. We know that to walk with somebody like that, through the things that they faced, would be both an honor and a privilege. And it would produce such a strength of character in us. Paul had that steadfastness, and those who walked with him had that steadfastness as well. And one of those men who walked with Paul is the author of our book, a man who is willing to follow Paul to the ends of the earth for the sake of the gospel. And that was a Gentile convert to Christianity by the name of Luke. 
author of both the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. Although some of the material in Acts was no doubt collected from different sources by Luke, much of the material comes from his own experiences traveling with Paul. There are many instances in Acts where the point of view changes from he or they to we, implying that the author himself was there with Paul during those periods. He was with Paul in the midst of his trials and tribulations, at least many of them. He was with Paul on Paul's second missionary journey, and he saw the savage and brutal attacks on Paul and Silas, their subsequent imprisonment, and their miraculous release. He was with Paul on Paul's sea voyage from Caesarea to Rome, when, as you remember, the ship was overcome by a storm of hurricane-like force that battered and ultimately wrecked their ship upon the coast of Malta. And Luke had swum with Paul through the breakers as that ship ran aground before eventually being broken apart by the waves. And we also know that among other circumstances, Dr. Luke also stayed by Paul's side when Paul was under arrest in Rome. Now the question is, why go through all of this? Why would anyone choose a religion like Christianity that would involve so much pain and suffering? Tim Stafford, a senior writer for Christianity Today, he wrote in one of his articles saying, A pastor I know, Stevie Belinsky, starts each confirmation class with a jar full of beans. He asks his students to guess how many beans are in the jar and on a big pad of paper writes down their estimates. Then, next to those estimates, he helps them make another list, their favorite songs. And when the lists are complete, he reveals the actual number of beans in the jar. And the whole class looks over their guesses to see which estimate was closest to being right. And Belinsky then turns to the list of favorite songs. And which one of these, he says, is closest to being right? And the students, they protest, well, there's no right answer. A person's favorite song is purely a matter of taste. And Belinsky, who holds a PhD in philosophy from Notre Dame, he then asks, when you decide what to believe in terms of your faith, is that more like guessing the number of beans or more like choosing your favorite song? Always, Belinsky says, from old as well as young, he gets the same answer. Choosing one's faith is more like choosing a favorite song. And Tim Stafford writes, When Belinsky told me this, it took my breath away. He said, After that, do you confirm them? Well, smiled Belinsky, first I try to argue them out of it. The concept of truth is an important issue because it affects how we view Christianity. Are we Christians only because it's meaningful to us? Or is it because we know it to be true? You see, a lot of people today, even many Christians, think that what is true for me is true for me, and what is true for you is true for you. But what they really mean is what is meaningful for me is meaningful for me, and what is meaningful for you is meaningful for you. It's pretty much the same as choosing your favorite music artist. It simply comes down to what you feel speaks to you. But I want to stress to you that this is not how the early Christians came to faith in Christ. If choosing Christianity was like choosing a song, I'm sure that they would have sought a very different tune. No, for the disciples, it was more than that. Listen to what Luke writes in Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. He says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. You have the word 
here eyewitnesses, which is why there were ministers, by the way. People were willing to be ministers because there was eyewitness evidence that Christianity, founded on the resurrection of Christ, was actually true. And then you have in verse 4 this amazing word, and that is the word certainty. Luke writes to Theophilus in order, he says, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Now look at the rest of Luke's introduction at the opening of the book of Acts. It says in verses 1 through 3, In the first book, O Theophilus, meaning the Gospel of Luke, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and to teach, until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them, and after his suffering, by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Now, any Christian who says that you can't prove, at least beyond a reasonable doubt, that Christianity is true has not really read Luke. Because Luke believed that the resurrection was a proven event. And the evidence that he uncovered is what provided Luke with the intellectual groundwork to be able to receive and accept Christ. You see, if you were a Christian at that time, you had a good reason to be. It wasn't just because you found Christianity to be meaningful for you or because it gave you warm fuzzies inside. No, it's because it was true. It was verifiable. It was rooted in facts, in history, in geography. It wasn't out there somewhere in the cosmos. No, Jesus had happened right there in their very midst. They were witnesses. There were hundreds of witnesses to his resurrection. And these early Christians, they had nothing to gain in this world for following Christ, other than pain, persecution, and even death. And what I want you to note is that Luke's decision to follow Christ, it could not have been an easy one. Luke abandoned his whole livelihood, his whole medical career, he abandoned completely to follow Christ. As the disciples who had been fishermen left their nets to become fishers of men, so Luke left his practice to become a physician, not just for people's physical bodies, but for the body of Christ, for the sake of the kingdom. He went from a clinic, whatever that clinic looked like, to binding Paul's many wounds and no doubt caring for him and nursing him back to health after his many beatings. And he himself may have endured some of that. He had to doctor himself. So this was a major life change for Luke, a huge commitment, a change that can only be explained, not by the latest fad religion on the block, but rather in encountering the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The truth changed him. And Luke allowed it to reshape and change the course of his entire life. And that's how it always is when we truly encounter Jesus. It changes us. It empowers us. It moves us out of our comfort zone. And it makes us willing to face any persecution necessary in order to bring people the good news of the hope of salvation in Jesus. And my hope, is that in and throughout our study of this incredible book of Acts, we also might not just learn the history of the early church, but that we will also experience the same kind of spirit-empowered change that Luke, the apostles, and the rest of the believers experienced as they followed Christ. May we be overpowered, overcome, and changed by the truth as fully as they did. And may that truth shape us into being the men and women that Christ has called us to be. Amen. Today's episode of Lahem Panim has been made possible by Renton Park Chapel, a church that is committed to the ministry of sharing the joy of hearing and doing God's Word, and to the mission of bringing people into the life-giving presence of Jesus Christ in and through vibrant preaching, teaching, Bible study, prayer, and ministry to a world that is in desperate need of the healing touch of Jesus Christ. If you'd like to learn more about our ministry here at Renton Park Chapel or would like to request any of our messages here on Lahem Panim, you can visit us online at rentonparkchapel.org 
or lahempanim.org. You can also find us on both Facebook and Twitter. We look forward to hearing from you and thank you for listening. And may you know all the fullness of having in your life the bread of the presence of God.